Welcome back to Microeconomics. This is Dr. Jameson. You can call me Wes. Uh, I didn't make a video last week. I was traveling. Um, and next week we have our test, so I won't see you for another week and a half. But uh, I am excited. Today we're going to talk a little bit about market efficiency. Um, we're going to hit on a little bit of the topic last week, which was supply and demand, which kind of leads into market efficiency. And it should help us out. Uh, with our test that occurs next week. So without further ado, let's get started. Remember, market efficiency is this idea, right? That um, everything that is made will be sold. That the market will be cleared. That producers will supply exactly the exact amount that the buyers will want to buy and they will find an equilibrium price. Now, this is all from chapter three. This idea of supply meeting demand being perfect equilibrium, right? And that is an efficient market. But my question to you, and the question that we'll ask throughout this video is, do we even come close to market efficiency in America? And that's a very difficult question because I don't really think we can. Um, we're always going to have price increases and price decreases. We're always gonna have leftover product, what we call glut in the market. And sometimes when we can't find something, like right now, I'm trying to buy an Xbox Series X, but they are out. They're out everywhere, right? So, uh, and that's because of a shortage in microchips, of all things. So, um, because there's a shortage, I can't get what I want. Um, but you can find, literally, Nintendo Switches all over the place. There's a glut of them. So, yes, uh, there are these two ideas that... That, that yes, we come close to market efficiency, but we will never quite be there. Um, yeah, the base definition for what is efficient is this <laughs> This allocation of resources is when all net benefits uh, of all economic activities are maximized. So let's try to understand what net benefits are first. So in microeconomics, there's there's two people, right? There is you, the buyer, and then there's the firm, the supplier, right? And so net benefits, right, to a firm or somebody that's making things, we call this profit, right? But net benefit to you, the buyer, means that uh, we call this utility, like the amount of good that you're getting from something, the amount of use and happiness that you'll derive from this product. like. I just can't wait to play Halo Infinite and it's going to make me infinitely happy. But I don't have it right now, so I am not happy. I am very, my, my net benefit is very, very, very low. Um, but yes, uh, the uh, Xbox right now is doing uh, very well because they can't make enough of them. So their net benefit is very high. But as long as we understand that as the consumer, you benefit from utility. And as a supplier or a firm, they benefit from profit, okay? Uh, now we're going to introduce a com uh, this idea of marginal benefit versus marginal supply, okay? Now, I think this can get pretty confusing, especially if we think that last week we were talking about supply and demand, right? Supply, demand, right? But I want you to understand supply and demand is for the general market itself right now individuals still face this exact these two exact same curves now we call this marginal benefit versus marginal cost okay so uh think about it like this the the, the supply and demand curve is for the market itself the whole market now marginal benefit versus marginal supply in the exact same co in the exact same way is for the individual the buyer or for the firm itself so the definitions are here marginal benefit is the amount in which the additional unit of an activity increases its total benefit okay for every little bit that you spend are you increasing your benefit marginal cost is also the amount in which each additional each additional unit of an activity increases its total cost now the marginal decision rule is that if the marginal benefit of an additional unit exceeds the marginal cost. The second the benefit is more than the cost, you should stop doing it. And it kind of looks like this. Um, oh, myself out of the way here. Right? It looks exactly 
like the supply and demand curve. Uh, you can see it, it crosses in the exact same way, uh, and it looks exactly like this, right? And so there is a point where there can be equilibrium in the marginal cost and marginal benefit. And this is how much the maximum you should pay for it, right? Because if you pay for any more, you are going to outweigh, you're gonna outstrip your benefit. It's gonna to cost too much and you won't get as much enjoyment from it, which is not good. This gets a little bit more complicated when we think about things like, what if the supplier um, only makes this much, right? Well, then the, the price will be lower, but all of these people that could have been buying something won't be able to buy anything. These people are good because they were able to buy something, but the quantity, you can see if, if we come over here, here's the demand right here. This amount of people cannot buy the good. So right now, um, Xbox isn't making enough Xboxes, right? And so right now there is a dead weight loss. They are not getting my money. They need my money, they want my money, but they cannot produce enough. They're producing right here when they should be producing right here. They're producing right here, I would be able to buy one, right? Um, the cost may be a little bit more, but I would definitely buy it because I want an Xbox Series X. I want to play Halo Infinite. There is another condition that makes markets very efficient. And this condition, it's not just the marginal uh, decision rule, right? It's not just um, if your marginal benefits equal up to your marginal cost. There is another factor in this. Um, there's a couple more factors, and I want to just talk about those really briefly. And I think these are really important to, let's say, the people of Utah. Property rights. Property rights. Ch -ch -ch stay off my land, right? Property rights are a set of rules that specify the ways in which the owner can use a resource, right? If you are not allowed to sell your own tomatoes, you cannot uh, profit from them, right? And that creates an inefficient market. There are two other little parts to property rights that you should know, especially for the test. Uh, exclusive property rights, the property right that allows the owner to prevent others from using the resource, right? You cannot let somebody else sell your tomatoes and make profit. They are your tomatoes. And then transferable property rights means that the owner of the resource is allowed to sell it or lease it to somebody, right? So that means that you have a tomato that you grew from the earth. Oh, you watered it. You babied it. It's a perfect little tomato. <laughs> but then when you sell that to me for some good or trade it to me for a chicken, um, the chicken is now yours, but the tomato the tomato is now mine, right? And so you have now transferred that property right. So both of these are very important to an efficient market, but there is something that gets in the way all the time in this country. That's right, the government. Because when you sell someone, they want their piece too. And so we have to ask ourselves, does this form an efficient market? That means that no matter what you produce, the government always has a part of it, right? When you sell your little tomato and you sell it to me for the chicken, they want a part of that sale. And this, of course, is called, uh, well, of course it's taxes. Not Texas, taxes. That's right. Um, so this is the thing that creates somewhat of an inefficient market here in America. Uh, but we'll get a little bit more into the government right now. So, just a recap of the characteristics of a market economy, right? You need private property, you need property rights. That property right gives you freedom of choice to be able to sell to who you want to and to be able to buy from who you want to. Um, of course, there's going to be winners and losers in a market economy. Uh, some people are going to be able to sell for more profit. Some people are going to be able to sell for less profit. And then, of course, this is the problems, right? The system of market and prices, of course, is completely bent, uh, completely uh, built upon this idea of limited government. But we have to ask ourselves, is the government that we have right now limited enough that it's not causing market failures? Now, 
Market failures occurs when a private decision maker in the marketplace fails to achieve an efficient allocation of scarce resources. Right. Um, but what does that mean? Well, um, either too much or too little is being produced. Now, this is for several reasons, right? Uh, number one, monopoly. Um, externalities. Now, what externalities are like secondary causes of something. We can think about things like pollution or, you know, for, for, for example, this shortage of microchips is an externality that is not allowing there to be enough Xboxes being produced in the market today. Uh, public goods, like public goods are, are, are also externalities that are caused by the government. Things like, think about things like um, roads or think about things like national defense, right? Our government spends a lot of money on national defense, but they could spend that money somewhere else, right? Um, if you choose to. Uh, and then, of course, imperfect information, meaning that <laughs> you don't, as the buyer, don't know everything. Now, the question is, is any of these justification for government intervention? Now, there is one thing I want to ask a question about with this whole government monopoly uh, intervention things. What about Facebook and Twitter and Snapchat and all these places? Um, should the government step in? right we have created this idea that these people are independent agencies right but because of that um we have allowed them to essentially create their own monopoly space based on social media is this a monopoly should the government step in maybe maybe not i don't know uh but these are the questions the one thing i'll say about economics is like like i've been saying uh, for the past month. Economists don't know everything. I don't know everything. Uh, your book thinks, talks about things in a very black and white manner. And economics just isn't so. When we look at things like the supply and demand graph, which we can go back to, right? They show these two lines, these two perfect lines. And in reality, these lines are very blurred. They're very blurred. You're going to see a lot of lines, actually. It's going to be a very blurry, blurry, blurry here, blurry, blurry, blurry here. So when we think about things and we're learning about economics, we study it like this. But in reality, it is a very, very, very blurry, very, very blurry market. Okay, last thing. You have a test coming up next week. Um, you only get one shot at it. I've given you an hour and a half for 33 questions. There's going to be 28 multiple choice questions, five essay type questions. I'm not looking for actual essays, maybe a few sentences, three sentences, maybe. Um, nothing too hard. I think one of them is actually only a list of things. So, yeah, just, you know, answer to the best of your ability. Um, and I will grade those personally. Well, the rest of the questions will be graded by the computer. Uh, but the key to this is studying the guide. I've released to you a study guide that is on Canvas. It's going to give you a list of the terms that I think if you know these terms and kind of understand the concepts around these terms, uh, you're going to be just fine. Uh, you want to make sure you study before you open the exam. I know you're going to have your book in front of you. Um, I would, but I don't want you flipping through trying to find the answers. You will run out of time. So you want to make sure that you study first, know where everything is, understand the concepts, and then open the exam. Keep in mind, you only get one chance at this. Um, and this is an online class, so the expectation is that you have a secure online uh, connection. So you, I, I, I can't accept any, I can't like do any redos because of connectivity problems. You want to make sure that you find a solid connection. Um, then, uh, secondly, I want you to know that class is moving after the test, is moving to a Thursday to Wednesday schedule meaning that your uh, assignments will be due on Wednesday instead of Sunday. And that's how we finish off the semester. Um, I hope everything is doing so well for you guys. I've been grading your stuff. You guys are doing great. It seems like you're understanding the material. Um, I I've had a few students reach out to me um, for questions. Please keep doing that. Uh, if you want to set up a Zoom meeting, I'm also here for that. Uh, don't hesitate to uh, get a hold of me. You can also text message me if you are interested in a quicker answer than email. Uh, my cell phone number is again on the syllabus in Canvas. Um, 
yeah, let me know. I'm here for you guys. You guys are doing great. Good luck on the exam. Uh, and I can't wait to speak to you guys again. Bye, guys.